The RNLI station was established at Port Rush in 1860 with a lifeboat called Zelinda, which had sails and oars and was crewed by six men. The vessel was capable of righting itself within five seconds of being capsized, then emptying itself only half a minute after being swamped. Zelinda cost £180, which included a transporting carriage, and was kept in the boathouse at Kerr Street, beyond the south pier of the harbour and overlooking the Mill Strand. The Zelinda was later named Laura, in honour of the Countess of Antrim, and was replaced in 1889 by the Robert and Agnes Blair. In 1892, a slipway for this new lifeboat was constructed near Portendu, followed by the boathouse in 1900. The Robert and Agnes Blair suffered tragedy on its first service when three crew were lost attempting a rescue, an event still referred to as the Portrush Lifeboat Disaster. In 1902, a new lifeboat called the Hopwood arrived. This vessel carried a crew of 15 and was to be the last Portrush lifeboat reliant on sails and oars. The Hopwood saved 23 lives and was in service until the TBBH arrived in 1924. The TBBH was also the last lifeboat to use this boathouse, as the rocky shore here made it difficult to launch. It was moored in the main harbour until the current RNLI boathouse was opened in 1928. The current Portrush lifeboat station was opened by the Duchess of Abercorn in August 1928. The lifeboat at that time was the motorised TBBH, named after the surnames of the English donors, Thornton, Bartlett, Brystead and Hooper. The TBBH would serve throughout World War II. The TBBH was also the first lifeboat at Port Rush to have essential equipment such as a searchlight and a line-throwing gun. In total, ten lives were saved during the war years. On occasions, however, the TBBH would spend long hours searching the sea without success for lost ships, life rafts, planes or pilots. More commonly, the lifeboat was able to escort damaged ships to go to the aid of fishing boats and merchant vessels or provide essential support to the Royal Navy. TBBH was replaced by the Lady Scott in 1949. She and her crews had performed many outstanding rescues, saving 70 lives before the Lady Scott was decommissioned in 1981. The most daring rescue occurred in 1960 when the lifeboat joined forces with the frigate HMS Leopard and the Royal Naval Whirlwind Helicopter to rescue 29 crew stranded on the helpless Argo Delos. The Greek cargo ship had run aground in horrendous sea conditions off Malin Head. The Lady Scott was battered against the side of the larger ship during the operation but managed to bring ashore 14 of the men before the helicopter lifted the remaining 15 to safety. Two of the crew of Lady Scott were awarded RNLI medals for their courage, which were presented to them by the Duchess of Kent. The Lady Scott was replaced by the Richard Evans, which served from 1981 to 2000. The ill-fated Kitty Hannon followed. She was lost when she was dashed onto rocks at Rathlin Island in 2008. The present lifeboat, William Gordon Burr, is equipped with the latest technology and can reach speeds of up to 25 knots. It is supported by smaller inshore lifeboats which play a vital role in responding to emergencies closer to the shore. One of the most famous call-outs of the Richard Evans was immortalised by local photographer Ian Watson. Ian photographed the lifeboat leaving the harbour in hurricane-force winds at 4pm on the 13th of February 1989 to go to the assistance of two Spanish fishing vessels in trouble off Donegal. I invite you to listen to the account of Mark Mitchell, one of the crew members of the lifeboat, on that famous call-out. 
please also take time to visit the Royal National Lifeboat Institution Museum in the Boathouse. My name is Mark Mitchell and I'm presently a training officer with the RNLI. However, in 1989, at the age of just 21, I was a student and a volunteer crew member on the Richard Evans lifeboat stationed at Portrush. On the 13th of February 1989, we were asked to go to the aid of two Spanish trawlers foundering off Donegal. Nothing unusual, except for the weather. The wind speed indicator at the top of the mast was screaming at 113.5 miles an hour. I had done several call-outs, but this was the most dangerous to date. We sat at the harbour entrance for what seemed like a lifetime as we strapped in and prepared. We were all well-experienced seafarers, but we knew this one was going to be bad. As one mountainous wave after another surged past the harbour mouth, the coxswain saw his chance. He was looking for a trough we could get ourselves into and slammed the throttles forward. Almost a thousand horsepower launched us into the maelstrom. I was terrified, but we weren't allowed to say so, or were we? In those days we couldn't show our fear anyway. Seconds later, the seventh wave caught us and we were now suddenly on our side surfing down a wall of white water towards the trough. In a lesser boat we would have been dead, but the legendary stability of the Richard Evans Aran-class lifeboat pulled us back to something resembling an even keel and we turned to face the next one. The crew were thrown about and it was obvious, however, that the deputy second coxswain Terry Murdoch's ribs were broken. Despite the injury, he went on doing his job at the radar. At the end of the day, there's only seven of us on that boat doing the job, so we go on if we can. The next wave, we climbed, climbed, climbed before it was plucked away from below us. Now, 28 tons of boat and men were falling, 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 our propellers beating in clear air. Surely no boat could take the inevitable impact. As we hit the wave's trough, the sea exploded around us. We were now completely submerged. The constantly moving window wipers, designed to clear away heavy spray, were now stopped by the force of the sea, their powerful motors screaming in protest. Every rivet and bolt shuddered as the Richard Evans fought her way back to the surface. But then there we were, on the next crest. The next few waves were the same, but as mariners will know, a boat needs her sea room, her room to manoeuvre. And as we broke out of the bay and into the open sea, the waves, though giant, became more predictable and we could now read them and brace ourselves for each impact. Just then, the radio message came through. The two Spanish trawlers, which had been in difficulty, were now in the shelter of Loch Swilly and were no longer in any danger. The message said we could return home, but we couldn't. No boat could turn in these conditions without inevitable capsize. We had no choice but to go on, towards the shelter of Loch Foyle and the haven of Greencastle, relatively sheltered from winds of this direction. Normally a 45-minute passage, we battled on for three hours as the coxswain played the throttle and wheel to keep us upright. At last, the welcome shelter of Inishowen Head was sometimes visible above the giant waves which seemed to be as big as the Himalayas. Once again, the legendary Aaron fought off the advance and we were within the safety of the mighty loch. I unstrapped and with my colleagues went forward to prepare the fenders and ropes for mooring up. Mechanic Anthony Chambers pushed the buttons that would bring the faithful Caterpillar diesels to a well-earned rest, and there it was, silence. For the first time that night there was an almost painful silence, and there we were, alive and alone with our own thoughts. 